Welcome back. You are watching CNBC TV 18 special coverage of the third G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting here in Gandhinagar. For central banks around the world, there is a big concern on how to regulate the cryptocurrency sector. The G20 has asked the IMF and the Financial Stability Board to come up with a synthesis paper on what can be done on crypto assets going forward, whether a roadmap can be agreed upon or not. We caught up with Bank for International Settlements Head of Research, Hyun Song Shin, on the risks related to the cryptocurrency sector, stable coins, and the importance of central bank digital currencies. Uh, the Financial Stability Board, the BIS and the IMF together have come up with a synthesis paper on cryptocurrencies and stable coins and crypto exchanges as well. Uh, lay out the challenges for us, especially when it comes to cryptocurrencies, because your recent report to the G20 has said that crypto's inherent structural flaws make them unsuitable to play a significant role in uh, the global economy. Uh, what are some of the ch challenges that you've highlighted before the G20? Thank you, Parikshit. Uh, uh... Thanks for the invitation. Um, well, there are two main types of risks with crypto. One is the conventional financial stability risk, uh, but there's also a broader set of issues to do with the macro financial risk, to do with monetary sovereignty, uh, and also monetary policy transmission, as well as capital flows and so on. So um, the BIS report is part of a, of a number of reports that have come to the G20, and our focus has been very much on the the longer term structural issues to do with crypto, whether uh, those structural features make them suitable uh, as money, as the basis for a monetary system, and how those structural features feed into uh, you know, these uh, risks that we've outlined. Now, one of the findings that we have is that although crypto operates under the banner of decentralization, they in fact turn out to be highly centralized. Uh, for example, um, you know, think about FTX uh, that collapsed uh, last November. Uh, it was a very centralized exchange. It was also uh, engaging in uh, lots of intermediation activities in an ecosystem that has many um, uh, centralized parties, like crypto hedge funds, that have leverage as well as maturity mismatch. Um, and, um, uh, and we can get to the other structural issues uh, um, uh, later. But for these reasons, we think uh, crypto is not really suitable as the basis for a monetary system. Right. Uh, when it comes to cryptos, would you be, in a way, pushing for a, for a ban on uh, cryptocurrencies altogether? I think a ban is certainly one of the options, uh, you know, either, um, you know, especially when it comes to specific activities. But I think we take a more comprehensive approach. Um, there are many three types of approaches here. One is the ban that you mentioned, but I think a more important uh, element here is the element of containment, uh, in the sense that you, know, you build uh, firewalls between the crypto ecosystem and the conventional monetary system uh, so that you can insulate uh, the conventional system and avoid the intertwining between crypto and the conventional system. But I think a very, very important element, of course, is regulation. So how do you bring to bear the rules that we already have for the conventional financial system and apply them in a consistent manner, in an effective manner, for the crypto ecosystem uh, itself? So there are three prongs to this. Are we expecting any sort of consensus on the G20 roadmap on regulating the cryptocurrency sector, the framework for regulations? Are you expecting some consensus or do you feel that there are diversions, very strong diversions among countries? I wouldn't say um, you know, there are very strong diver uh, you know, um, divergence among countries. What, uh, what I would say is uh, the uh, FSB standards on regulation is going to be a very key part of the overall discussions. Uh, but as we discussed before, uh, there are broader issues than simply the financial stability aspects. There are issues to do with monetary sovereignty. There are issues to do with monetary policy transmission. And these are uh, risks that affect, in particular, emerging and developing economies. I think uh, there is a broad recognition that uh, these taking a broader perspective is important. And uh, the way, uh, you know, from, from the discussions that we've had so far, I think, uh, you know, we will converge. Um, and I think it's um, converging to, um, to a place where uh, it is not only uh, taking account of the financial stability aspects, but also the broader, uh, you know, macro financial, um, you know, issues as well.
Right. So uh, will there be a framework that will be agreed upon by the end of it? Or you feel that there will be certain priorities that the G20 will agree on? There is a paper that is being delivered to the Leaders' Summit uh, that is going to be authored, that is, that is going to be jointly authored by the IMF as well as the FSB. So it's going to be a, um, a very comprehensive document that, account, that uh, you know, takes account of both of these aspects. Now, to a large degree, to a large degree, the policy towards crypto is going to be, uh, you know, will be led by each jurisdiction. For the reason that we discussed before, uh, the priority should be to insulate the monetary system to make sure that you preserve monetary sovereignty, to make sure that the monetary system works for the public interest. There are also going to be additional concerns that have to do with the openness of some economies and uh, the, the issues to do with uh, money laundering, the anonymity of crypto, as well as uh, the standards for, you know, standards against um, you know, money laundering um, uh, and other illicit activities. Um, and I think those will be uh, a, if you like, a set of standards that, are, that will be work in progress. But um, what this meeting uh, will do certainly is to give that uh, discussion a huge boost. Right. Uh, how do you look at recent bank failures in the United States and Europe? Could there be uh, further pressures in the banking systems? Do you, are you monitoring certain jurisdictions for issues like that? Well, uh, Parashit, we, have, uh, we are now emerging from a very long period of low for long monetary policy. And during that period, uh, you know, various vulnerabilities had built up. One of those was the lengthening of the maturity of debt, um, uh, if you like, uh, interest rate risk and duration risk. Uh, and the banking sector issues that we have seen so far this year can be seen as one aspect of that. Uh, because some of the assets, some of the securities that, uh, that some of the banks were, uh, were holding were much longer term than the funding, and uh, there were some you know, uh, accounting issues which, um, which didn't mark these uh, assets to market. Now, um, as we normalize monetary policy, and it's going to be a long, um, and, it, it, and there will be bumps along the way, um, what we saw in March was that some of those uh, you know, uh, vulnerabilities did materialize um, into, uh, into the failure of a, of a couple of banks. Since then, though, we have seen um, a, a moderation of those kind of risks, and we see that in market conditions as well. But of course, that doesn't mean that the risks have, have not gone away. Uh, that doesn't mean that the risks have gone away. The other important point to make is that we should not be focusing if you like, sector by sector, we should take a broader view because the same types of interest rate risk and duration risk, of course, are out there in the financial system more broadly. So whether it be the banking sector or the non-banking financial intermediary sector, uh, you know, the same kinds of risk will be uh, you know, latent there. So we have to be very watchful um, and not uh, get too focused on a particular sector because otherwise we'll be missing the bigger picture uh, for the um, you know for the for the details, right? Uh, and finally, your annual economic report said that gains made so far in the fight against inflation or much or much to supply chain easing and commodity prices falling. Which are some of the challenges and risks to the global economy that you see for this year and next year that you're highlighting to all the banks? Indeed, and um, you know, as we say in the report, we we have seen some gains in the fight against inflation. A lot of that uh, has been coming through in headline inflation because uh, the supply chain bottlenecks have eased quite considerably since the height of the pandemic. And we've also seen a decline in commodity prices, uh, in, in food and energy in particular. But we're still seeing core inflation remain quite stubbornly high. And that's going to be the challenge going forward for central banks in their monetary policy. They have to stay the course to make sure that uh, you know, we can address core inflation because that is something that is much stickier and is going to hang around for much longer. Now, as we do that, uh, we have to think about the broader set of uh, policy tools out there. Fiscal policy is really a very, very important part of the overall package because monetary policy and fiscal policy, although um, you know, they seem to operate on the surface 
uh, according to different, uh, you know, uh, different imperatives. Actually, they are very closely uh, joined up, not least because fiscal policy will have an effect on the real economy, and there are balance sheet interlinkages of the central bank between fiscal and monetary policy. Um, and so as we go forward, fiscal policy and monetary policy, they have to be much uh, better coordinated uh, in order to tackle these risks. And not least, uh, we have to take account of financial supervision, financial regulation, so that uh, we can deal with uh, emerging risks as they materialize. That's all we have time for on this special broadcast from video journalist Harun Chippa and me. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.